Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down Yeah I could sing I could sing your love forever Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down, yeah I can sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever Good morning and a warm welcome as you join us here at Orwell and Portmoak Church. Uh, we come towards the end of April and I do hope you've been enjoying the wonderful spring weather which, with which we've been blessed. Although, of course, our gardeners and farmers are looking for just a little more rain. Um, in her refreshing Praying Together uh, page on our church website, uh, Ginny quotes from the Song of Solomon words that I think beautifully sum up the glory of this season. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And these words have a rich spiritual application too, and I trust the joy of that may also be yours. My thanks as ever to our small faithful online team, to other weekly participants, and I hope that you enjoy the Makaton blessing at the close of today's service and find it appropriate. Today, the theme of God's covenant love is near the heart of our reflections. Let's listen to some verses of Psalm 136 a psalm which celebrates how encompassing that love is and calls us to thanksgiving and praise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever and freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature 
His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Our first praise. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Now shall we unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If one offered for love all the wealth of one's house, it would be utterly scorned. Almighty God, in infinite love you created this world, and in love you sustain in being all that you've made. In love you came among us in your Son, and in a love that did not count the cost, you gave yourself in him to the uttermost to reconcile sinful humanity and all things to you through 
the death of the cross. In awe and wonder we say with the Apostle John, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Gracious God, we confess before you that we have not loved you as we ought. In mad rebellion, we left home for a distant country. And when you came among us in love, we drove you from our midst and nailed you to a cross. Have mercy on our pride and wickedness. We confess we have not loved one another as we ought. Too often we succumb to hatred, deceit, jealousy, one-upmanship, gossip, slander, bitterness. We put down rather than build up. We marginalize those we consider a threat. Have mercy on our selfishness and our lack of compassion. We confess, O Lord, that we have not loved your good creation as we ought. Although appointed its stewards, we've allowed our choices and attitudes to be directed by lifestyle preferences rather than your word. Have mercy on our carelessness and unfaithfulness. Grant us the grace of true repentance and a wholehearted return to you our faithful and merciful God. In doing so, you promise to turn to us and to lavish upon us all the wealth of the love you have shown us in Jesus. So may we love you, one another, and your creation after the pattern perfectly given us in Christ our Lord. And now pour out your love in our hearts, we pray, that it may clean out all that negates it and that we may abound in love by the power of the Holy Spirit. Graciously accept and bless us in our worship today. And as we are blessed, may the glory be yours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there for 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, 
and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Our second reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, at verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to receive the food of your holy word. May it work your purpose of grace in and through us, and renew us in the image of your Son. So may we be blessed and you glorified. Amen. Today we're beginning a short new series looking together at one of the most beautiful books in the Bible, the book of Ruth. It's so short that flicking through the Old Testament you might easily overlook it. As I hope we will see this little book, a love story at core, has a refreshing message for us all and shines its light into the gloom of our uncertain times. All being well, this brief series will take us up to the time of Pentecost, which marks, the, of course, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the first disciples. Each year, Jewish communities read the book of Ruth during the Feast of Pentecost, celebrating the spring harvest of barley and wheat. That's appropriate, for it was just as barley harvest began that Ruth and Naomi arrived at Bethlehem. And then we find Ruth gleaning in the fields until the end of the wheat harvest. Today, the church generally calls this period between Easter and Pentecost the season of Easter. In the early church, however, most Christian communities called it Pentecost. Uh, this then seems as good a time as any for us to be looking together at the message of the book of Ruth. A word first on the context. I always think of Ruth as being like a little child with two small, with, with two tall adults, parents perhaps, on either side. In our Bible, it's tucked in between the two biggies, Judges and First Samuel. The reason for that is chronological. The events recorded in Ruth, as its first verse tells us, took place in the days when the judges ruled. And the last verses of Ruth connect its events with the coming great king of Israel, whom we meet in 1 Samuel. 
Ruth and these two surrounding books differ greatly, not only in size, but in content. Judges and 1 Samuel deal with events on the big national uh, political stage. Heroes and kings stride their pages, people like Deborah, and Gideon, Samson, Samuel, Saul, and the rest. By contrast, the book of Ruth is all about the fortunes of a very ordinary family, one family, whose individual characters, with the exception of Boaz, are mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. They come center stage from nowhere, and as the book ends, they disappear from view. In the world's eyes, they weren't important people at all. But in terms of God's covenant love and purposes, they had an absolutely vital place and role. And remember, Ruth has a Bible book named after her, uh, one of only two women so honored. And indeed, Ruth is the only book in the Bible to be named after someone not racially Jewish. And that is a large part of the point of this book. C.S. Lewis said, there are no ordinary people. You never talk to a mere mortal. Ruth, as one writer put it, is a story for people who wonder where God is when there are no dreams or visions or prophets. It's for people who wonder where God is when one tragedy after another attacks their faith. Is a story for people who wonder whether a life of integrity in tough times is worth it. And it's a story for people who can't imagine that anything great could ever come out of their ordinary lives of faith. So, turning to Ruth, the scene is set for us in the first verse, as we've seen. The events recorded here took place during the days when the judges ruled, literally when the judges judged. Somewhere in the period between the death of Joshua and the coronation of Saul as Israel's first king. It was a time of repeated crisis. One or two of the judges, uh, leaders who came to the fore at these times, uh, did quite well. But for the most part, this was a period of national decline, politically, socially, economically, morally, spiritually. And we can almost see mirrored in that period long ago, many of the problems uh, of our own 21st century life, with its deficit of trustworthy leadership, economic instability, poverty traps, homelessness, violence, racism, sexism, family and marriage breakdown, all in the context of a widespread rejection of God and, uh, of, uh, and uh, of his word. The dreadful situation is summed up in the shocking last verse of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. And then to crown all the mess, something life-threatening to the whole population broke on the scene. It wasn't a coronavirus, but it was a dreadful famine. And with a subtle hint of irony, we're introduced to a family who are going hungry in Bethlehem of all places, hungry in the house of bread, which is what the Bethlehem means. The threat is real, and the head of this family, Elimelech, whose name means my God is king, decides to take matters into his own hands, and he removes himself and the family, Naomi, his wife, and Malon and Kilion, their sons, to Moab, some 50 miles away on the other side of the Jordan, where the famine appears not to have struck. Moab was certainly a strange place to go to. Moabite history, from an Israelite perspective, was rather sordid. They worshipped pagan gods, notably Chemosh. Was it a failure of trust in God as his king that took Elimelech with his family to be refugees in Moab? Possibly, we are not told. Some who think so see an irony in the meaning of his name. We can certainly have sympathy for the heavy burden of responsibility Elimelech must have felt in this crisis to find food for his family. 
and he believed he was doing what was best in the terrible circumstances. In any case, the family's fortunes in Moab went from bad to worse. First, Elimelech died, and then the two sons, uh, Malon and Kilian, having married Moabite wives, Orpah and Ruth, also died. Malon means sickly, and Kilian something like pining, extraordinary names, as if, as if given to them in dark anticipation, a bit like, you know, calling your son coronavirus. <laughs> Actually, that, that is the name of a notable character in Asterix and the Chariot Rays, one of the Asterix comics, which, where some of us learned our classics. Anyway, now Naomi is left in an unenviable situation. She's a widow childless, unsupported in a male-dominated culture, away from a people who speak her language and worship her God. Naomi's state of mind is revealed at the end of the chapter, where now in Bethlehem again, she asks to be known not as Naomi, meaning pleasant, but Mara, bitter, for, she laments, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? She had left Bethlehem full, but returns empty. There's irony here too, of course, in a chapter that begins with hunger and ends with harvest. But back in Moab, all that's left of this family are three vulnerable widows. Widows now lacking any human support whatsoever. They have been pushed right to the margins of this male-dominated culture. And like C.S. Lewis in The Grief of His Wife Joy's Death, Naomi doesn't think to doubt God's existence, but she does have a quarrel with him for his apparent harsh and bitter dealings with her. Well... God's shoulders are broad enough for that. And yet the story of Ruth is about a God who treats no one as ordinary and takes those who are labelled outsiders and marginalised by others and makes them central to his great purposes, central to the narrative of Israel and of the church and of the world itself. And we see how this begins to unfold. In her despair, Naomi somehow hears news of a turnaround in Israel. The Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. Very significant language. And now after all the disasters that had befallen her, Naomi decides it's time to return home. So as Naomi heads for home, we come to this famous scene at the crossroads on a dusty road between Moab and Bethlehem. Both Orpah and Ruth, her daughters-in-law, had accompanied Naomi, and they were minded to go with her to Israel. As they journeyed, Naomi has clearly become increasingly preoccupied with one issue, the security of her much-loved daughters-in-law. Now, it's all very well for us to joke, you know, that a woman needs a man as a fish needs a bicycle. But Naomi knows that without a husband in Israel as in Moab, they are dangerously vulnerable, even more so for them in Israel as foreigners and of all people, Moabites. And so she halts and urges them to return to Moab, each of you to her mother's house which is a slightly strange expression uh, in the language of that time. Possibly her thought is that mothers are better matchmakers than fathers. Probably true. And she prays for the Lord to give them security in a husband's home. It's a moving, tearful scene showing the deep mutual affection for one another of these three women. 
Naomi again laments that the Lord's hand has turned against her. And with reluctance, Orpah is persuaded by her arguments and in floods of tears bids her mother-in-law farewell. And Naomi turns to Ruth and says, Now, Ruth, you go back to." And then we have these incredibly powerful words of Ruth. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Astonishing words. And their significance is enormous. And on this so ordinary a scene and conversation, we realise hinges the future of the united monarchy in Israel on which future generations would look back as the nation's high point. But far more than that, on that conversation hinges the coming of the great king, the Bethlehem-born saviour of the world, the promised Davidic Messiah, who, as to human genealogy, would be Ruth's direct descendant. See, God's hidden hand was at work in all these events. But neither Ruth nor Naomi knew any of that as Ruth clung to her mother-in-law and made her faithful, determined, risky commitment and pledge in using language that echoes beautifully the language of God's covenant with his people. And as the narrative point, pointedly stresses over and over again, Ruth's ethnicity makes her an outsider and her widowhood makes her so terribly vulnerable. She is the husbandless Moabite. But for Ruth, there is simply no going back now. Her commitment is total. And the consequences of that are incalcul uh, incalculable. And when they reached Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred. But there's no sense at all that the town reached out to Ruth in welcome and acceptance. For Ruth the Moabite, there's apparently no place, certainly no place near the heart of the community. But God's perspective on Ruth is the very opposite. Ruth is at the very centre of God's eternal plan and perfect purpose with an absolutely crucial part to play in the unfolding of the history of salvation. And doesn't it show how careful we must be in our assessments of others? God sees not as we see. We look in the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. In Ruth, we're seeing an ordinary woman with extraordinary faith. And we, in turn, are called to follow her on the path of humble trust and unswerving commitment to the Lord and to his people as we forget what's behind and reach forward to what lies before. But in this book, we also see an extraordinary God the God of providence and of grace, whom Ruth has chosen as, as her God. The God who takes uh, those, the world and sometimes even the church, uh, those they marginalize, and God takes them and places them at the very center of his overarching plan. A God who can be trusted wherever the, f the journey of life takes us, who can be trusted to give us a future and hope even when the world seems to be collapsing around us. 
the God in whom our truest security is found. For us, he is the God who has revealed himself fully now in Ruth's great descendant, Jesus Christ, and who for us and for our salvation was driven to the remotest and most humiliating of margins. Never be afraid, said Corrie ten Boom, to trust an unknown future to a known God. The God we know in Jesus, who gave his son to die and rise for us, we can trust implicitly, is what Ruth is saying. Ruth's enduring testimony is that you can safely cast all your cares on him, for he does care for you. That wonderful poet William Cowper's counsel still stands. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. As Paul wrote to the Romans, and he might well have been thinking of Ruth as he did so. Our bedrock confidence lies here, whatever the times are like. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. May God bless these reflections on his holy word. Loving God, even in our lifetime, so much has changed. So many things that we considered permanent turning out to be passing shadows. We face choices and difficult decisions. Help us to look to you, the one unchanging reality in a world that is constantly moving on. We think today of the young folk facing the future, surrounded by uncertainty, worried about the changes to educational courses and exams, and anxious about career prospects. Give them a sense of your loving presence so that whatever obstacles are faced and whatever disappointments are experienced, they can bounce back from them with your help. Equip those around our young people to listen, to guide and to support so that their decisions and choices are well made. We remember those who are facing change as they mourn the loss of a loved one, hearts broken, Tears a constant companion, and laughter and happiness seeming a distant memory. Reach out into their pain and give them the knowledge that you understand and share their sorrow. May your arms enfold them and your light scatter the shadows. Lord of all, we look at the changes we have made to the world in the name of progress where rather than nurturing and protecting, we have exploited. Help us to live less wastefully and with more thought to the generations that will come after us. Challenge the hearts and minds of people everywhere so that we all appreciate the wonder and fragility of your world. We pray for those who strive to bring about positive change in the world who work to offer new hope and improved choices for the downtrodden, marginalised and oppressed. Strengthen and uphold them and encourage their efforts with successful outcomes. Our country faces challenges and choices ahead. Grant our leaders wisdom in all that they do and courage to make tough choices when necessary, but also a real desire to work towards a fair and compassionate society. 
Give those in positions of power or influence the insight to make just decisions, as well as the determination and skills to tackle the many challenges. We thank you that although we may wander from you, confused by life's turbulence and overwhelmed by difficulties, you always seek us out. Help us, instead of regretting what has been, to look forward to what is to come and to be ready to grasp and respond to the opportunities and choices you give. Lord, in your mercy, hear all our prayers and in a moment of silence, we bring our own personal thoughts before you. Blend our voices together. Unite us by your spirit as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord show kindness to you. May the Lord grant each of you rest. May the God of Ruth be your God and his people your people. Gro gras troch gydag is she vo year and taheth a mach agus an spirit nu malle di vule an ish agus gushiri. And so may grace, mercy and peace from God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Hiya, my name's Becky George. Welcome to our Makaton UK Blessing.
children, and their children.